Mike Kreusel, uh, good to have so many with us. Welcome to the last session of what's been a really a very exciting and, and stimulating uh, conference. Um, my name is Paul Mize. I'm um, chair of uh, Donald Cymru, the Wales Lucy 2 Link, and I'm a trustee of the Wales and Africa Health Links uh, Network. And it's my privilege this evening to introduce you to um, four of the groups that have been uh, working during the, this last period. But I just would like to take the opportunity to thank a few people for, for what we've uh, enjoyed over the last two days. Um, we've certainly had a series of very fascinating sessions uh, with contributions from inside and outside Wales. And I think we've all been given a lot of food for thought, um, many challenges, certainly, uh, but also a lot of encouragement. Um, just to be uh, parochial for a moment, because I think one of the things that struck me during the first two days is, is, is to be really, perhaps I don't like the word proud, really take note that, um, that we were the first UK nation to have a wellbeing and future generations bill, which will inform and look at the work we do. To have a minister for social justice and isn't so much of what we do about trying to in increase the likelihood of people getting social justice across the world and um, the setting up of uh, a health links network to support each other and also the first uk notion to have a chief nursing officer from a, a minority background and um, i think we've heard over the last few days some several very senior leaders as to how much they support the work we do um, so we really ought to be um, in a good place. We've also heard some, um, in detail, the inspiring work that's been going on in Zambia, Malawi, Namibia, and, uh, and, and several others. So in this session, we're moving away from ideas, aspirations, policies, um, to actually hearing about um, partnership working. There's no doubt that COVID has created a many difficulties and challenges for all of us um, working with partners in sub-Saharan Africa. And a lot of us have, have adapted our ways. I think there was talk at the start that quite a few organisations actually might fail. Some organisations might fall apart. And it's great to know that that hasn't happened. And we're going to hear today of people who've really done some um, sterling work uh, in terms of keeping those partnerships going and, and doing something very creative. Um, so I did say that I would make some thanks because I've been given 10 minutes, which I don't need. Um, so I would like to thank uh, a few people, particularly like fact Catherine Thomas, um, who has worked so hard to, to get the content and the creation and has been at every session and has stepped in when there are difficulties and has really provided fantastic leadership to the Wales and Africa Health Links Network. So I'd really like to thank her. I know she's had other people working with her and set her up in the programme. So thanks to all those who um, have organised this programme and kept it going. Thanks to Hub Cymru Africa team. You've been absolutely great in the background, uh, supporting us, helping us, Whatever our level of competency and confidence in working in this fashion, you've been there to support us and a huge amount going in the background. I'd like to single out one individual because we haven't seen him at all, and that's Peter Gilby. I don't know whether you're still around, but you've been the guy at the back that's actually making sure that the technology works and when things have gone wrong, and believe me, they have gone wrong in the background, as little of that shows to those of us who are watching and listening and participating. So thank you so much, Peter, for being in the background and for doing all the work uh, preparing for this conference. And thank you also, of course, to the huge number of contributors who've um, given time to come and talk. And those of you who've attended, some of you have kept going right through the full two days, some of you popped in and out, and that's been the joy of this, that people can uh, pop in and out and they're not sort of committed to two whole days. Um, so I think it's been um, a fantastic, um two days um we won't spend a lot of time doing thanks at the end because at six o'clock let's face it we're all going to want to go off and cook our tea and whatever um let's move on into this session then so we've got um four four teams that are going to be talking this we've got um teams for you are going to be talking about their move into healthcare from other areas we're going to hear from life for african mothers about raising covid awareness and deprived communities in liberia we're going to hear from Don and Cymru Lesotho about their well-being in schools work. And then we're going to hear from the Betsy Busia link in developing a health needs assessment app. Each team will have uh, 20 minutes. And in order to ensure that we keep to time, that I'm going to strictly keep to that 20 minutes and uh, there will be guillotines. 
Um, so be warned. Uh, so first off, uh, a great welcome to um, Ziz and uh, Benson, I think, um, who are going to talk from Teams for You uh, about their move into healthcare. Ziz and Ben, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> I love the fact that you said uh, you'll keep us firmly to time because anybody that knows me knows that I can um, witter on anyway, but I will, I'll do my best. Um, oh, thank you, um, Claire, for uh, uh, displaying our pretty image there. Benson is with me. Um, he's our partner in Uganda and is the head of the programs there. Um, and I'm just going to talk a bit about how we uh, moved uh, from the kind of work that we do into uh, a more of a healthcare partnership in Uganda. Um, so those of you that, that know us, um, Teams for You uh, operate uh, in Uganda and Sierra Leone. Uh, we are a small charity based in North Wales in Wrexham uh, and we have projects that predominantly focus on uh, menstrual health and wash, uh, water and sanitation. Uh, you can move on Claire, thank you. Um, so just a tiny bit of background. I know the writing's a bit small here. Um, we started uh, a lot of our work with um, nurses and with medical professionals uh, about three years ago when we started an adolescent sexual health programme. Uh, this was just after the Ugandan government released their um, uh, sexual health uh, curriculum. I'm sorry, my partner is dropping in and out. I think his signal is quite bad, but hopefully he can get back in uh, if you have any questions. Um, and we uh, we realised um, that they weren't getting a lot of facilitation teachers, medical professionals, etc., and how to implement this new adolescent sexual health curriculum. And that's where Teams for You partnered uh, in Uganda, in at the Kumi district of Uganda, with several teachers, several schools, and with several um, local nurses on the ground to try and help deliver um, this kind of training and build up the capacity of teachers to deliver this training. Um, so, uh, over the last three years, we've actually been able, uh, or the team has, I shouldn't say me, the team has uh, trained over 300 teachers in Uganda and Sierra Leone uh, with this programme. And 85% have actually said they, are, they feel much more confident in delivering very sensitive topics to their pupils, such as contraception and the cultural and religious beliefs that are associated um, with um, adolescent sexual health. And um, you can see in the image, um, one of the nurses I'm gonna talk about, Alice, um, who is delivering to the children directly about um, menstrual health and the taboos associated to menstruation. Um, and this is how we started working with um, nurses and having a much more collaborative relationship between education and health. If you move on, please. Um, and this is Alice. So she's an enrolled nurse in one of our community health centres um, as a government community health centre uh, in Kumi, uh, Uganda. We worked very, very closely with her um, because she's a, a sexual health expert and she came in and did an awful lot of the, the teaching and the training uh, with the different teachers, community leaders, etc. And also started um, sharing her passion for adolescent sexual health to anybody and everybody and started getting a lot more nurses engaged with the program so that we could roll this out um, with a lot more schools because a lot of the teachers really struggled to talk about these quite sensitive subjects um, and this is where the education health kind of merged and we created this relationship where they could both help each other um, so the, the nurses would come in um, get excellent experience of public speaking and interpersonal skills and um, build up their CV learn new things um, and the teachers would also benefit and the, and, and the children as well from this uh, really important messages that we wanted to get out um next slide so alice has actually worked with us for about three years um and uh, she's actually uh, kept improving on her education as well throughout that time uh, and it's really exciting to see where she'll end up next um so how did we in within the covid period uh really sort of up our game 
Um, and this is just a little bit of what we have done in, in this ridiculous season that we've all endured. Um, we, as I said, that the relationship was predominantly education and the, the sort of crossover into healthcare was, was just to um, really use excellent expertise and, and the right local, you know, the key people that know the information um, to facilitate uh, that program. Um, but as we started to get to know them a lot more, um, we, they began to explain to us some of the issues that they were facing. And in the Kimi district of Uganda, um, there are many health centers that offer community 24 seven healthcare, particularly maternity um, and immunizations, that kind of uh, regular daily treatment. Um, and uh, we, they, they kept saying to us, you know, these were some of their staff were the ones that partnered with us with the schools. They were telling us that, uh, that with the pandemic, they were really struggling for basic essentials. So they were really struggling with just basic things like hand washing equipment, soap, hand sanitizer, uh, personal protective equipment. Um, they were actually having to turn people away um, because they, they couldn't even uh, test um, they couldn't conduct the test, they couldn't immunise people because they didn't have the right equipment uh, to protect people well. So we were actually um, already on the ground funded with a different programme and we were able to um, utilise some of that funding to have a, a specific COVID response. And that response enabled us to go into 14 of those health centres and provide them with this essential equipment. Um, whilst we were there and I shouldn't shouldn't just I say me it wasn't me <laughs> but whilst the team were there um, they uh, noticed a lot more of the the sort of real genuine needs um, that these uh, health professionals were battling um, a lot of them just genuinely didn't have access to water and so they were having to go and fetch water uh, through uh, jerry cans, you know, those yellow plastic containers. They, some of them would have to go kilometres away to get that water, leaving their patients to go fetch water and come back again. Uh, patients themselves weren't able to look after their hygiene or wash or any of those sorts of um, basic things. And so we were extremely grateful to um, the Wales and Africa Health uh, well, the grant scheme was we were able to secure some funding and support a general hospital and two um, health centres with a complete refurb of their sanitation systems, uh, including piped running water throughout their facilities, uh, toilets and showers. And this was a, a major um, investment and a major kind of move for us as a charity to to not just focus on our education element, but actually to to really focus on improving the quality of, of healthcare. Um, and it, it was it's been a really powerful project. And I, I will bring hopefully Ben, if his connections okay, in to to give us a, an update, you know, from his perspective of, of how much that has made a um, a difference. Um, Last slide, please. Um, and this has terribly tiny writing, um, but this is a comment from um, Susan, who is the Deputy uh, District Health Officer uh, for CUME. And uh, she actually didn't know anything about us. So, you know, she's we've been in um, obviously in the CUME District for over 12 years and she's uh, one of the, the lead health um, team there on a government policy level and she had not actually encountered her charity until the COVID response even though many of her staff had been working alongside us with the adolescent sexual health program um, but because of the COVID response and because of the relationship that we started creating we were able to move into a more um, uh, sort of as a personal relationship is a bit but a relationship with Susan and with the the district education uh, district health office I'm getting my words tripped up um, but as she says um, just how amazing that the program was to improve um, uh, you know the, the sanitation in those hospitals and how much that's improved patient care patient hygiene but also staff morale uh, the ability for the staff to wash and clean themselves um, to prevent cross-infection, for the staff to actually not have to go out in the dark, 
you know, you know, to in the middle of um, a night shift, they don't need to leave their wards to go out to find the nearest latrine. There's a toilet within the facility. Um, they don't need to fetch water uh, and leave their patients whilst doing so. So it's all of those things, really um, a practical project that has been um, very impactful uh, and one we were delighted to be able to facilitate. Um, is Ben here? Yes, is I'm here. Thank you, um, Claire, for displaying that beautiful presentation. <laughs> um, um, ben, obviously, this is your project, and you implemented it. Um, in your, you know, in your words, how is the move to from us from education into healthcare? I mean, we do both now, but how how is that? How's that gone during the pandemic? Um, basically, because we're a small charity, we have been focusing on uh, the schools, the education department, but uh, uh, we needed the health, uh, sex, uh, health department to assist us on uh, uh, educating the kids on the adolescence and sexual health related issues. So well, when we are trying to roll out uh, uh, the Develop with Dignity program, which uh, involves uh, teaching the girls on menstrual health and hygiene, we thought it was necessary to, to train, the, to interact with the nurses and find out how, how this is done. So. That's how we started building the relationship. So we picked up one of the nurses to join us on the trainings. That's where we are able to, to interact more and know the needs that uh, the health department was uh, was facing. I mean, the problems they are facing. And uh, also we use the health uh, centers because every school like uh, three or four schools are connected to a health center. So basically our relationship is uh, basically to ask those nurses to be able to go to those schools so that the kids get used to them and they share the problems and they are, the children are being supported within those health facilities around their schools. So that was another key why we, we thought it was necessary to move in. And then uh, uh, when the opportunity came for the grant, I mean, during the COVID, uh, we are not able to reach out as well to the, to the children at school because of the lockdown. And uh, we had the things to be done and we needed the, their support basically. So we used them uh, to go and carry out to data collection for us and uh, keep doing the uh, trainings with the, the with the girls and boys in schools when the when the top classes were only allowed to be in school. So we thought we saw it very useful when they gave us the feedback. So we kept working with them. Uh, they did work for us for about two. They went there three times. And yeah, it was very good. And when we got an opportunity to apply for the Welsh grant, Welsh for Africa grant, uh, we really knew there is a very big need in the hospital because the only hospital in the, the district, only government hospital in the district didn't have uh, running water in the wards, in the treatment rooms, all the toilets were broken, nothing was working, and it was very flipsy, very smelly. You could not go near the toilet. Uh, so a lot of infections were happening there. People would come and go back infected because the place was very dirty. So when you got that grant, we, uh, we connected the water, plumbed everything in, and it's now very good. It doesn't smell anymore. They're keeping the floors very clean and uh, we do appreciate that support. Plus, of course, the two health centers are very happy. They are like using them as the model 
health centers for the area. They have their incinerators, they are able to burn their rubbish, not collecting them in the, in the hall and just leaving everything there. They put in an incinerator and burn it, which is very good. Basically, it's been a changer for Kumi and the local district is, is very appreciative and very happy with the, the support that they have received. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate it. I'm very aware that our time is almost um, done. I just wanted to kind of pick up one of the things that, that Benson said um, that was just really powerful for us was uh, we did this relationship with the health team um, meant that we actually were able to kind of give this project to them to run. So they were doing the data collection, they were writing the reports, they were submitting them to their local government and to the people that were, you know, that are going to frame policies for the area and, and decide where funding's um, going to be levelled. And so that was really good. It was, um, it was a collaboration that we were able to, you know, facilitate and implement this amazing programme, uh, but it was run very, very much by um, the team on the ground in relationship with the health office. Um, so that was uh, an exciting move for us. And I think Ben explained that really well. Um, and that's it, Paul, um, from us. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, uh, Ben and Ziz. And what a great example of, of, of changing your approach to meet the circumstances and, and go forth with a, um, a fantastic project. Um, just looking, I'm not sure there are any questions as yet coming in. Um, so it, uh, are you going to carry on with this? Is this going to be um, work that you're going to do elsewhere or are you going to go back to your um, adolescent health after this? Oh, well, Paul, now, come on. We'll, ne I'll, we'll never leave adolescent sexual health. It's an essential part of uh, education. It's really important. Um, nevertheless, uh, we we will certainly... Um, this this re relationship with the health office is uh, an incredible one. It's a vital... Um, it's a partnership. You know, education and health go hand in hand. Um, so the... The more that we can do uh, to support the health centres and to support their needs, uh, definitely we will be continuing. We have had, um, well, I mean, Ben can talk about this, actually, but we have had requests um, for, uh, you know, trainings and, and different ways that we can facilitate getting different people from, from other uh, health centres in the country to, to help and um, to bring, you know, increased capacity uh, for the different medical staff as well. So, you know, this is this is definitely um, something we will we will look to to grow and expand in and, and just do the best that we can. OK, thank you. We have got a question now in for uh, Benson. We've still got three minutes. Um, Benson, it must be very de demoralising for health workers to work in the conditions you described and brilliant that you were able to help. Uh, was it easy to find the skills and materials locally to do this? Uh, yes. Uh, it, it was very frustrating for most of the people working in those areas uh, when uh, it was in that condition, but they are very happy at the moment. Uh, and, uh, the, the materials and the skills are available and uh, it was done by the local, the locals and the materials were sourced within uh, the Kumi district and uh, uh, some of the materials were got from Kampala. So everything was got locally in the country. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions coming in. Um, so can I thank you both very much indeed for uh, joining us. I hope you'll stay with us till the end of the session because it just may be if there's any spare time at the end that there might be some questions that will come in perhaps for, for for any of the four teams to, to answer. So if you can hang about. But in the meantime, thank you very much um, for, for, for joining us. Um, particularly from a long way overseas. And it was great. We were able to hear you nice and clear, Benson. So 
Um, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I think we've temporarily lost Paul. Paul, I'm not sure if you're here, but you're certainly muted. Hello. Excellent. Yes, you're I'm here. Here. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm here. Sorry. Um, do we have um, Life for African Mothers? Do we have uh, Angela and, and Abdul? I'll bring them onto stage for you now. Great. Um, sorry, Welcome I'll just back. wait a Welcome both. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, can I just let everybody know that um, at the end of this talk, we're going to have five minutes or so break. It's a two hour session. It's a long session. So um, we'll allow time for people to have a little break and then we'll get started just just before five to make sure that we finish on time. Okay, so let's hear from Life for African Mothers. Okay, hi everybody. Um, my name is Angela Gorman. I'm uh, the CEO of Life for African Mothers. We're trying to reduce maternal mortality and newborn mortality in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, our two main activities uh, are the provision of medications to prevent women dying of postpartum hemorrhage, which as you know, is the biggest killer of women. And also we facilitate visits by midwives to Sierra Leone and Liberia um, up until the time that the, sadly, the pandemic hit. Um, so we had to think differently. And so we started providing um, Zoom workshops uh, to both countries, gathered midwives gathered in the capital of both countries. And so that was what we started to do. And it worked out very, very well. In fact, it's now developed to the point where some of the more experienced and confident midwives in the groups are now going out and sharing the information that we're passing to them on the three main topics, which are postpartum hemorrhage, the use of partogram, and neonatal resuscitation, which are the big three biggest challenges uh, for the staff. So, of course, when COVID hit, we, as I said, we had to think differently. And, and then from the point of view of the COVID, we thought, what can we do? Those of us who um, have visited Africa and, and when the pandemic hit, um, apart from dealing with our own communities here in, in Wales and England, our next big thought was, this is going to decimate Africa. We were really very frightened that this was going to rip through Africa and cause huge deaths, when in fact, for our two countries, Liberia and Sierra Leone, that wasn't the case. We were uh, extraordinarily surprised to find that this wasn't what happened. And and I we, we've come to the conclusion that these two countries learned a great deal from the Ebola crisis. So when both countries identified their first cases, both countries locked down immediately. See, we could have learned a lot from Africa. It's not the it's not Africa learning from us. It's we could have learned from Africa. They locked down immediately, curfews, everything. And so the numbers have been minimal. But as you are also aware, there are many deprived areas in these countries. And so uh, we were approached by um, the British ambassador in Liberia, who was a great supporter of ours, go and visit him, and he attended our workshops. Uh, to deliver, uh, to present certificates, etc., and he informed us and other other um, organisations working in Liberia that there was a fund available for us to do some COVID awareness sessions, and we um, and that we could target pregnant and nursing mothers. So we we applied for the grant, and we got just under twenty thousand uh, dollars, which Abdul, who you will meet soon is um, he headed up and then he worked predominantly in West Point, which is one of the biggest slums in Monrovia. Uh, 75,000 people live there. 
so of course he was only today able to do part of it so other people wanted us to to help them as well so we then applied for the grant from the wales for africa and abdul was able to then continue the sessions with all sorts of information and um and so really abdul has taken the lead on all of this he's our country representative so um, if I could hand over to Abdul now uh, to continue, he's he has a PowerPoint and a short film. You there, Abdul? Hi there. Do we do we have Abdul and do we have the PowerPoint? Um, we're struggling to find Abdul in the audience to invite him to stage at oh. the moment, Paul. Um, so we're going to wait for a couple of minutes to see if he appears. He's just um, sent me a message to say he's trying to. 16. Oh. Yeah. If, if he, he's if he he's there now, Claire. He can Excellent. start. He's there I bring him on. Thank you very much. I can start the presentation and then Abdul can take over when he when he appears. Okay. It sounds as though um, we're going to be able to bring um, Abdul in. Uh, oh, Abdul. Great. So just bear with us for 20 seconds or so. Um, and if there are problems, yeah, that'd be great if you could get started and then he could take over. Okay. No, it looks as though there may be problems because Abdul is on a mobile, apparently, and that oh. creates a little bit of difficulty. So, Angela, would you like to um, go ahead and uh, we'll... Yes, of course. If somebody could load up the... Um, could open the uh, presentation for me. While while that's happening, can I, can I just ask you? Because you mentioned involvement of the British ambassador, and, and I wondered, um, do you think that's that's really useful? Is, is that something others should think of? Is using British ambassador, or um, is that sometimes maybe seen as as being too influential from an outside country? Uh, no, because they he approached. I mean, we've known him for a long time. And then he contacted us and said that they were approaching organizations working in Liberia to see if they could help to minimize the risk of COVID, you know, going through the country. And because we are well known in the in the country and in the community, and particularly the slum, because the, the women there receive our medication when they need it, um, he felt we would have probably quite a lot of credibility. But I think the ambassadors are a resource that we should be using. We should be using we weren't aware of this fund um but he was and he let us know and other organizations so we were already on the ground essentially and were able to to sort of get going straight away um, so i don't i did send the powerpoint in is it um can it be low oh there we go Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I, t I really just noticed that um, the camera wasn't on. Not such a bad thing, really. I think that, if I'm honest, I think they're looking for it, Angela. Okay. And there was a film that I sent in yesterday. I hope it's there. Okay, it remember. looks so the film can be played. I can see that message. So... Would that be okay if we if we show of course, the film yeah. first? Great. It's quite difficult to understand this lady, but Abdul will come in Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming. Uh, 
to be part of this particular process, right? And Abdul Ba heading this particular organization for life African models in Liberia. And uh, when the COVID started, COVID-19 started, there was huge challenges, you know. Uh, most of the time we talk about our first month of our boyfriends are not working, and then uh, there was no way that we could buy pocket and save them buy food and buy samples for our children, right? So all of those things were around us. So in order to help minimize the spread of COVID-19, we talked to our partners, left African mothers, and the Wales uh, Bank team in uh, Cardiff, Wales, for African League. They, and the ways of volunteer. They, they help us yes, to say, look, it will be able to help to reduce these two providing hygiene materials. And these are the hygiene materials here. The bucket, they have bucket, they have some chlorine, uh, data, and some small papers with a uh, rice in it. Right? We know that you have all the challenges around. This but not really carry the cold water, but the pocket will last for a very long time where you need to be used again and again. And also reduce some of the stress for the day, right? So thank you very much for coming again, and we appreciate it. So as uh, you call your name, your number, you come, we give to the bucket, and then, uh, if you want to speak to us about it, how you feel, fine. If not, that's okay. So it's not anything that end of the process. But this is something that we thought that it could be helpful for you. When we went over there and discussing, at the first time when the British government gave us some material, we went down West Point. People from these communities called us, saying that, look, you don't need to have another community in the and so on. And you people have been helping in this community. And then I met with the ORC and other people we discussed it and we thought that it's important that It was difficult to hear him, wasn't it, really? Um, m most of it, I think, one could hear or, or work out what it was. Yes, yes. Uh, don't worry about that. You got the gist of it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. So I regret to say they're still looking uh, oh, for your really? presentation, but um, we're, we're still optimistic. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've given you the outline to, to it all, but... It's been extraordinarily successful. And if you've been following the numbers in uh, some of these countries, the COVID infections, um, when I spoke to Abdul yesterday, he said, we've had five positive tests today, five. Um, and I, th I think people are probably skeptical about record keeping um, in some of the countries, but, but I, they are genuine because it, there have been around just over 100 deaths in both Sierra Leone and Liberia from COVID. Um, and so really that's the, the test. The, it's the death, however many are. He's just sent me a message. Please ask them to log me in. So is he there in like the waiting room? Right, we've got your presentation, so that's uh, number one success and okay. progress. Next, we need to find presenter. Yeah, it says, please ask them to log me in. Okay, team, can we um, can we let Abdul in? Can you see him in any form of waiting room? Hi, Paul, he's I'm trying to join from a mobile phone and you can't join from a mobile phone, you have to have the app or be on a computer, oh. unfortunately. Okay. So is that a definite he will not be able to join us? He can, he's a part of the audience, but he can't join us on stage. Okay, I just sent him a message if he can log in on the app, the laptop. But anyway, the um, uh, as you can see, the, the, the project name was supporting pregnant women so the hence the link with maternal mortality so could I have the next one please so um this the, the projects were almost identical really the first one with the uh the foreign fcdo it's called now the foreign commonwealth 
Development Office, and we essentially extended it further into West Point and a couple of other of uh, the slum areas. Um, because when when the first project was done, of course they um, people around saw what was happening, and and they all wanted uh, to be part of this. So that we had volunteers who were paid a small amount each day to um, to help out. Uh, they were given food and um, donations of resources, buckets and hand wash to help with cleanliness, which of course they now got permanently. So it was um, it was very well received by the community because, as I said, we're well known in the community. So it didn't need any uh, persuasion really to allow us to to work in there. So so thank you to the volunteers. Okay, thank you. The next one. So, um, as you can imagine, a lot of the uh, organisations actually moved out or they've reduced their activities in these countries and to, to support, um, to look after their own staff. But, of course, um, that led to issues ha you know, going on in Liberia and other countries. Um, but because we have our in-country representative who was able to, to gather the, his volunteers around him, he was able to be up and running pretty quickly with this this project that we were doing. And I have to say that once our, our application went into the Wales for Africa, um, the WCVA, the response was so quick because they obviously understood the speed that was needed to as the prevention. And so within a very short space of time, we had the the, the response to say that we got the grant and the, the money was transferred. So I have to say thank you for that because that's, you know, it's unusual with funding organisations. So, and it helped a great deal. The quicker we went in, the quicker we were able to do the preventative work. Thank you. Um, we were one of the organisations that we didn't stop our operate. The only thing we didn't do was send the midwives in, but the, the medications that we send to five countries, actually, Liberia being the, the biggest recipient, and Sierra Leone, we were able to send uh, four and a half, four hundred and fifty thousand 450,000 of the tablets to prevent um, hemorrhage to our five countries. So that's about 150,000 women who were able to, to access it. So we were able to continue doing that, but that presented challenges because of flights being reduced, the numbers of flights being reduced into all the countries with the lockdown, but we managed to get uh, the medications through. Um, oh, I don't know what that is. I'm not sure what that is on the screen. Well, it's certainly not part of your presentation. No. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, so we're a Cardiff-based organisation, and this is our focus to reduce the number of women dying in pregnancy and childbirth. We work in Sierra Leone, Liberia, uh, Cameroon, Somaliland and the Eastern Congo but Liberia and Sierra Leone get the largest amount of resources from us and travel there quite a lot and I was astounded I have to say at how how they managed the pandemic as I said they locked down, there were curfews six in the evening till six in the morning, the little roadside uh, businesses were stopped, um, hence the need for food they had no money to buy food and I kept saying are you sure those numbers are right up are you sure I said yes yeah and the numbers of people hospitalized were were very low and um I said they've had just over 100 deaths throughout and Sierra Leone very much the same so as I said earlier we can learn from Africa this time not the other way around so uh as I said we travel we, we continued using zoom to do our sessions and, you know, anybody who sat in a classroom or stood in front of a class, you can pick out the stars of the class, the confident people who, you know, were very um, chatty and, you know, wanting to learn more. So what we decided to do was we picked them out as champions for their topics, whether it was postpartum hemorrhage or partogram. And we gave them some additional information and training. And then they went out into... Uh, other hospitals and beyond out into the rural area to, de to uh, disseminate this uh, information. And uh, we've had extraordinary responses. And what we're doing is giving ownership 
to the midwives and to to the country essentially which is really what the ultimate aim is is to for us to not to be needed um so we were empowering the midwives um so one of the benefits of of um of a of sorry of covid has been just this because we couldn't go we were able to empower the local midwives to do some of what we were doing so okay thank you Could I have the next slide, please? So the first, as you see, the first um, phase was the British Embassy funds. They gave us just under twenty thousand pounds. We sorry dollars. We were initially advised to apply for ten thousand dollars, and then it it appeared that some of the organisations didn't apply. So we were told we could up it to twenty thousand, and so um, so we did. And Abdul was able to work in these slum areas. Old Road, New Crew Town, and West Point community. West Point is houses seventy five thousand people, and it was an extraordinary success. Um, and then, uh, so we we then went when the money became available from the Welsh government, we uh, applied and we got um, just under fifteen thousand. We also got one for Sierra Leone, and a similar uh, project was done in in um, a slum in in the capital that houses 11,000 people. So uh, we've re certainly made our mark. Um, and uh, the, the Welsh, we, we provided reports to the, the British Embassy and to the Welsh Government on the success of what we'd done. And um, it, it's gone down really, really well. It's amazing what we can do from a distance, really. Thank you. Can I have the next slide? Yeah, so uh, two main strands contributed to the health platform in Liberia. Community awareness. There's nothing like getting out into the community um, to meet with people. And, you know, I said normally you'd shake their hands, but we couldn't. Um, and sensitization and all sorts of ways. Jingles on, the, on their phones, jingles on the radio, handouts. As you can see, all sorts of things. Thank you. Have the next one, please. So um, March uh, this year, we, we did the second phase. And, uh, you know, I don't look at the bucket in the same way as I did before. You know, buckets are precious. Um, we, baby clothes, sanitary materials for the women and rice to pregnant women because their nutrition is so important. And um, uh, as I said, it was a great success. So this really worked and was very significant in to fight COVID in Liberia. Because if you can imagine, social distancing is not easy when you live in a slum. Um, so we had to modify everything accordingly. But extraordinarily, people, um, and I keep saying about learning lessons from Africa, when people are told to do things, they do them. You know, there's no question. There were no, no demonstrations. or When people were told to curfew at 6 o'clock, apart from essential workers, they did it. They all stayed at home. So um, it was very humbling, really, to to see and hear what was happening there. Thank you. Have the next one, please. Oh, there we are. The um, This is the second. Sonny Wine is probably one of the poorest hospitals I've ever visited in Liberia. Um, I mean, they're all, they're all, you know, in out in the rural area, they're all poor. But uh, I think Sonny Wine is probably the 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 least well resourced of of anywhere. And uh, as you can see, it was 150 mothers and babies benefited from the three months from March to June. Okay, thank you. So these are some of the quotes. Um, what as a Come by West Point. The initiative is very good that Wales government identified with the people of Liberia through pregnant women, babies, and their mothers as to battle COVID nineteen during this difficult period. So at the, at the program, flyers and stickers were distributed. Had the WCVA logo on them. Radio station newspapers. Um, there were big articles in the newspapers about what we were doing, 
and awareness in the different dialects, um, talking about the Wales and the WCVA uh, initiatives. Thank you. So there's the publicity. There's Abdul on the local radio, one of the volunteers going out with the buckets and um, and the newspaper uh, with, you can see the WCBA logo right in the middle of the page. So Wales certainly has a significant profile and as an organization, we are recognized. We have a partnership with the Liberian government and um, they ask us if we can do things. They've asked us if we can facilitate things. So, you know, we have their confidence, which is a, which is lovely to, to know that. And the same with Sierra Leone. Thank you. I'm not sure if that's the last slide. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I don't know if there's any questions to for now or whether to leave it to later. I'm thank sorry you. about Abdul's absence. I, no. Such a shame. Thank you so much, Angela, and, and we, we should apologise to you because I, uh, that was disruptive. You've not been able to get your slides when you when you wanted oh, them. Worry. So don't worry. Apologies for that. And, and apologies okay. to Abdul. It's really sorry you've not been able to, to join in. I hope you're still there and, and able to listen. Uh, I'm really sorry that we're not able to get you in because you're you're on a phone. Um, we, we, we have gone up, um, over, but I think that was absolutely necessary because of the disruption to the start. Um, Okay, just just one one question. Let me have a look um, before we stop. Um, we have a question here from Catherine. How did you get funds out of the British Embassy? Well, we put in an application in the same way that we would. Um, the British ambassador told said to us and the other organisations working there that he, that the embassy had been given a pot of money by the Foreign Office, so it was DFID, of course, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. Um, uh, to to distribute, to try and um, prevent COVID running right through the country. And, um, and so uh, David Belgrove, who was the then uh, British ambassador, has now been moved to Gambia, sadly. He, he contacted the organisations in the country that were working that he felt could do this and said, can you please apply for some money to do this? I've got this, this pot of money. So we put in the application. And then he came back to us and said, you can up the amount of money that you apply for. So, And so the volunteers all uh, worked with Abdul to put all of this out there. And I don't know, it, it's hard to say whether what we have done has, has reduced the number of people who became very sick. You can't quantify it, really. Uh, it's like juggling with fog, really, isn't it? But I think there's a general feeling out there that we were able to help. And we, we sent a report to David Belgrove uh, on the success of what we had done, the awareness. And, uh, but it, it wasn't, the money was there. It wasn't a case of us having to, to drag money out of them. Once we got the application in, um, they, uh, they came up with the money. Great, thank you. And I think there's probably a message for all of us there. I probably shouldn't shout it out aloud because it's probably not PC, but use our diplomats, if we, particularly if we have I, absolutely trouble, yeah. trouble at this end. Um, yeah. Let's unashamedly use our diplomats. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for that. And the other thing I was particularly struck by is, is the opportunity you felt that the crisis has given to actually push forward empowerment of the midwives and yes. their enthusiasm for picking up something that perhaps they weren't completely comfortable with to start off with. We call them champions now. They're, they're uh, neonatal resuscitation champions. They are partogram champions. They, they've they all got their individual topics that they want to go out and talk to um, their colleagues about. So, yes. Great. So many thanks indeed, Angela, for joining us. Again, thank sorry you. about the disruption. No uh, worries. Thank okay. you. Abdul, for uh, for your uh, involvement, and I'm really sorry we didn't get to hear from you your your part in it, which which sounds to have been really sort of fantastic. So thank you. please please hopefully you'll both um, hang about and and, yes. and listen to the rest. Um, we will take a break, but I think could we just make it five minutes? Um, the other two groups will certainly still get their twenty minutes, so don't please don't worry. Let's let's reconvene at five past five. Um, Please, uh, please do come back. Um, there's a lot of good stuff still to hear. Thank you very much.
Fabulous. Okay, Paul, we're back live and I'm finding Veronica and Sharon. Great. So, hi, welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you for staying with us. Um, so, in this uh, last hour, or just under that, we're going to hear from um, Don Cumberlucitu about uh, their work um, with uh, well-being in children and from the Betsy Link developing um, a health needs assessment app. So, welcome, Veronica. Hi. Welcome, Sharon. Uh, nice to see you both. Um, the floor is yours. Okay, well, I'm going to make a start, but can I just check, Claire, that our two videos are, are going to be ready after um, Sharon's done her um, little, little bit of introduction, <laughs> um, just in case you need to find them. So for those who don't know, um, I'm the director of Doll and Cymru Lesotho, and uh, we've been working between Wales and Lesotho since uh, 1985, so 36 years now. And our main focus has really been um, education uh, th through mostly schools and, and health, um, including a lot of work on mental health um, in the recent past, but also some public health in as much as uh, sanitation and, and hygiene is concerned. And then, of course, when the uh, pandemic came upon us um, last March, March 20, I'd just come back from Lesotho, and we suddenly had to adapt the way that we were working. And we had some projects that were already underway, like WASH projects. So instead of being based in schools, it went out into the community, which was very pertinent, really, to the, to the COVID messages of what had to happen. And um, we suddenly found ourselves not able to have people in the Sutu, and we had to um, work online. And it, it was all a big change, but it all went actually incredibly well. But of course, some of the things we did as well was responding to requests by partners. Um, we did some work, <clears throat> we did some new work on mental health and well-being of, for family doctors. And they asked for some PPE because there was a big shortage, as other people have been mentioning as well. And, um, and I've said about the hand washing as well. But of course, we also use some more traditional methods, which um, Sharon will tell you about in a minute, um, like the radio, which I was interested to see that um, Angela was using that as a, as a source of uh, information as well. So uh, something we've got in common and the fact and we had this project then that brought our two streams of work, education and health together. So a bit like Zez and Teams for You, you know, we're sort of COVID is giving us an opportunity to do something perhaps a little bit different that we hadn't done before. So this project that Sharon's going to tell you about was um, inspired by a book uh, which was produced by um, a UN committee, standing committee on, on uh, well-being and mental health. And it was produced by Children for Children called My Hero Is You. But Sharon will explain more about that. And but I think an interesting point to make is, as Angela just said about, you know, her midwives being empowered because they had to. We have found the same with the teachers in, in Lesotho who have taken on this well-being work and really run with it, as, as Sharon will explain, which they I they haven't done that before. And it was somehow being forced into having to do something a little bit different. And it they just grabbed it and ran with it. And it's been absolutely brilliant. So much so Sharon uh, presented to a WHO webinar, which went across the world. We were one of four projects that made a presentation about innovative ways of uh, addressing um, uh, mental health and uh, well-being during COVID um, epidemic. So that was a, that was a really um, big thing to do. And it was um, we're very proud that we were asked to present that. But no further ado, we'll go on to the person who's been dealing with this, um, and that's Sharon, and she can tell you a little bit more before um, you see the videos. Thanks, Veronica. Um, I, for some reason, my laptop doesn't like air meat, so you don't have to see me this evening, um, for good or bad, folks. Um, but also, I would just quickly like to say, so I'm education officer for Dolan, but um, Amelia Matsitsi, who is from Lesotho, is also here. Um, and later on, if there are questions, maybe we can use the chat for that, um, if there's anything directed to her, because she was really key in our partnership working on this project and 
quite serendipitously, we connected virtually. Um, we've never met face to face, but um, we've worked really, really closely over this project. So ordinarily, my, my role would be to train teachers in Wales to go to Lesotho and then work with teachers that come to Wales from Lesotho. Um, and obviously, all of that stopped. As Veronica said, we had to adapt pretty quickly. Um, and our success of working online with, with a cohort of teachers that we've got really good relationships with really let us um, move into this sphere of well-being quite smoothly. We've tried in the past, as Paul knows, we've we've done some audits and we've had meetings and you know it's been an area of interest for many of us for a long time, but we hadn't quite got there. Um, and then the, this book was published and we thought, right, okay, let's translate it. Let's get it um, on some digital platforms. Um, and then we partnered with the Early Learning Network in Lesotho to get it on the radio station. And it just worked so well. Um, and this is where Amelia was, was key to this because she translated and she, she made the audio narration. And that was all a new set of skills for her as well. So, so we were all on this journey together. And the, the radio shows went really well. It was a lot more expensive than we thought, um, but it inspired us to apply for a grant from, from WCVA. And the, the project has exploded really, way more than we thought it would be. Um, and it was to adapt and support schools, particularly learners in their gap of academic um, experience. They obviously had been in lockdown, but that had been for a year in Lesotho. But prior to that, they had been off school for nearly a year because of strikes. So we were in a really, really tricky situation. And so this book were, was seen as a way, and the radio shows were seen as a way to, to support, um, just opening back up. Teachers were nervous, students were nervous, parents were nervous to send their children to school. Um, and so on having access to this really helped. Um, and many of our teachers we've worked on literacy with so they were really open to using this as a resource um but i what i'll do actually I'll, I'll i'll ask to show our summary film of the project and then i'll talk a little bit more if that's okay because it's really complicated there's so many different facets that that came out of this this book um so if if we could play the the summary film um and then i'll i'll add more to it afterwards thank you Rata bona metswalea hai. Impa ho ne o sabolokea ho etsa jwalo. Se ra ne ala ka tsa kokwana ya soko ya corona e eme se o tsosala. Lady Tabata Bahalu Hokana Bartula Yuan. 
Okay, that was um, a lot easier to show you that than explain all the different parts of the project which interweave and connect, but they, they came out of, of the book, um, the collaboration with, with May Amelia, who's here, who also then wrote the scripts for these Action for Hero shows um, and, you know, interwoven with our work on literacy and, and phonics, early, early reading strategies in particular. Um, and it's just been so successful. You know, we're looking to apply for another grant now because we've, we've had another conference since then, which was on um, World Mental Health Day, um, which was, you know, this engaging, creative and innovative space where we had speakers all from Lesotho. I just do an introduction and put the thing together. Um, we had the government represented from the Learner Care Unit. We had REPSI represented, which is the Psychosocial Support Network in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, a project locally in Lesotho run by the Hub Marija, which um, provides non-formal education um, in called Skills and Soup. Um, and then we also had the director of Vision Street presenting. And I'm going to show you his presentation now, which is a short film, because this is is really the, the innovative part for us with, with regard to the storybook where um, Amelia turned the guidebook into radio shows and then Vision Street, the local media company, um, got in local children and adapted it again and, and went on a very steep learning curve um, to develop these shows that were aired over the winter holidays. Um, and as we come to the end of the academic year now in Lesotho, we We'll be sharing everything again on social media to ensure that we we've got as wide a reach as possible. Um, it's difficult to get impact figures when radio shows didn't have any means of, of capturing that. But using Facebook and, and boosting across Lesotho using Facebook means that we can get some impact um, figures and responses. Um, so, yeah, let me hand over to the next film, which um, is from Lebohan and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I deem it indeed a great honor to be given this opportunity to speak before a cohort of such distinguished guests and in such a distinguished occasion. I am probably the most unprepared speaker of the day. I mean, I'm just a photographer. Um, I'm not much of a speaker. And uh, give thanks to Dolan Campbell Wales, Mr. Tulink for giving me this opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, I am the founder and creative director at Vision Street. We specialize in a number of set skills in visual communication in terms of design, photography, film, corporate production, radio and television production. And it was indeed a great honor to be given an opportunity to produce a radio show based on Action for Heroes book uh, adapted from My Hero is You. Both the books, uh, My Hero is You and, and Action for Heroes present an opportunity for children to learn the basics and facts about COVID-19 and how to stay safe and adhere to protocols of safety as set by all health organization in the schools 
communities, home, and the playgrounds where the children usually spend most of their time at. Ladies and gentlemen, I must reiterate that I have we we have never worked with directly with kids before. We have helped yes a number of productions, but not managing the production with kids or an educational program with kids. And it was such a great honor and a great flight to cruise with since we we had to like embark on the research so that we learn exactly how can we work around the children how can we disseminate information to the children because we are not teachers by profession we are just content creators but having to manage um the production surrounded with kids we had to make this research involving psychologists to train us on the best ways and best practices and strategies to implement so that we can have a roller bond with kids that they will understand the message we are delivering to them. And we have had the strategies that um, in as much as COVID-19 as serious as it is, we have to deliver these messages in a style and language understood by kids to them because they were the target audience. Because we believe in a way the kids as target audience that are going to listen to the show and learn from other kids would definitely listen to their peers as they speak on the radio and share the knowledge to other children. So ladies and gentlemen, this, this, this has been quite a great opportunity. You'll hear for yourselves as we play the video after this presentation where the kids share their information and their knowledge and their understanding after learning on how to take care of themselves and those that loved ones around the communities, homes and schools as an adaptation to COVID-19. Because we, we believe that kids may just be a minority of the total population of the world, but they guarantee it 100% of the future of the global population. And it is of utmost importance to adhere to them and the safety of them and those loved ones around them during the COVID-19 era. At this juncture, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to play for you um, Action for Heroes film. It is a short video that captures the reflection of kids learning about COVID-19 and safety protocols during the production of the show, Action for Heroes. Kitobuaka <laughs> Virus <laughs> Happy <laughs> Oh.
Okay, how are we doing for time, Paul? We were going to cut that short, but we couldn't do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We've just got another another two minutes. I, I don't know whether you'd like to bring Amelia in because I think we are able to uh, to bring her in. Uh, we don't have any questions, so um, just I'm afraid only two minutes. That's okay. Yeah. If you could add Amelia to the stage, um, we can just get a little short reflection from her if she's still here. Maybe not. Oh, it says she's moving to the stage now. This is a new platform for all of us, I think. Yeah, so <laughs> whilst whilst that's happening, I I'll just um, close a little bit. And obviously, you can see the, the quality of the film there that Vision Street has made. So you can only imagine how good the radio shows were as well. Um, it's just been a very exciting time for us. And, and now we're at that point where we're finishing off um, the project uh, and looking to the next stage um, and now Amelia is here so if you can share my dear on just a quick summary on how it's been for you being involved in this project hello everyone can you hear me yeah good evening my name is Amelia Mutiti I'm working as an education project officer at Dolan Kimbre Welter Sutulink, a beautiful organization that just found me when I was in my lowest, lowest, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be part of you. Um, I got involved first um, by uh, when I uh, when I translated the book, the storybook for the children. Uh, which is My Hero Is You, How Children Can Fight COVID-19. And then later on, there was Actions for Heroes, uh, which acts as a guide for teachers in uh, teaching these children about uh, being a hero in the midst of the pandemic. So I also translated the Actions for Heroes into Sisutu, and then uh, inside the Action for Heroes storybook, there are nine chats in all. And um, this is an interaction between the adult who will be the parent or the teacher or anybody who will be reading the storybook to the children. So I um, out of those chats, that is when we, we derived a um, uh, the scripts for the radio shows uh, with the help of Vision Street, which uh, we have seen on the radio that was just playing uh, a, a while ago. So with uh, those chats, we, we developed the radio scripts and um, there were children actors, the beautiful children that you've just seen, who acted out the, the parts of the chats. It was just so beautiful. And then when everything was completed, then uh, we approached various radio stations in, in the country in Lesotho, and we managed to secure a slot with Radio Lesotho, which is the biggest radio station in the country. So that was amazing to have uh, secured that. And we cannot thank Dolan Kimbra enough for, for, for that part, because as expensive as it was, but it was a worthwhile thing to do for our children when they had missed so much of their schooling. Mm -hmm. So we, we continue to thank you, thank you from, <clears throat> from the bottom of our hearts, uh, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, for being so generous to our country. So the, the radio shows were then called, uh, secured with Radio Lesotho and um, there were three episodes of uh, My Hero Is You and those were airing on Saturdays, uh, three Saturdays uh, in a row. And then the nine episodes of Actions for Heroes, which were um, derived from the Actions for Heroes storybook, um, they played during the week. So we had in a week, 
Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, we had them um, playing on, on, on Radio Lesotho on, I mean, for three days in a week, which meant that they went for three weeks for the nine episodes to be completed. And um, for My Hero Is You, the, the episodes were such that there was there's a citation that was read. So children would be listening to the story on the radio. And then afterwards, they would call in and be asking, I mean, be answering questions that were posed on each episode. So it was a beautiful, beautiful reception because a lot of children were calling in during one show and it kept on improving until uh, the last uh, episode was at, which was on the third week. Mm -hmm. Thank and you, Mayor. Then, I, I just have to okay, stop you there, my dear. We, we, we're running right. out of time. Um, but thank you again for, for joining us this evening as well, because um, Lesotho's two hours ahead now and it was a very last minute request. But um, it's been a huge, huge success. And, and that is because of your involvement, May. So thank you so much for joining. Over to you, thank Paul. Thank you, May. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia, so much. That's uh, great that you're able to join in and, and, and thanks for sharing your experience. Thanks to you too, Sharon and Veronica. I mean, that's, uh, it's, it was great to see so many children uh, being involved at all levels, both nationally mm -hmm. and, and locally and with such enthusiasm. And um, it'd be good to have discussions at another time about how we can use uh, radios um, and, and other um, the press etc in the future but but for now thanks very much for sharing uh, sh your sharing your experience my pleasure daddy okay um so we have uh, one more presentation in just under half an hour um left so we're doing we're doing okay so um hopefully um just standing in the wings, uh, we have the Betsy Busia link. Um, so, do we have um, Jane Rose and Fiona and, and, and Bernard? Is, is Bernard also with us? Fiona, we have Fiona on the stage. I see Bernard. Great. And we've got Bernard. Okay, so um, over to you. Welcome. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try and put my camera on. I'm new. Oh, there we go. Can everybody? Can somebody just acknowledge that they can hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Fiona. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, uh, I'm just going to apologise in advance if while I'm speaking any fireworks go off there will be a barking dog um, because I've had some IT problems so I've had to do this from home work. Um, so yeah my name is Fiona Ray, I am a consultant in the emergency department uh, in Wrexham. Uh, Bernard's going to take you on our journey, I just by way of introduction just want to explain some of the background. So. Um, in contrast to the, the last team that were speaking, I, I would describe us as being an, a very embryonic link um, before the pandemic. So um, our link is with uh, Abusia County, which is in the far west of Kenya on the border with Uganda. And about three years ago, a preliminary visit uh, was undertaken by some of the members of the team that are here and some other members of the team who um, have since moved on um, and actually I wasn't involved in that um, so that was a preliminary visit was a sort of uh, uh, Bernard's going to talk about some of the things that came out of that uh, we were due to go uh, for a more formal health needs assessment visit in May of last year you won't be surprised to hear that we didn't and obviously we haven't been able to go and visit um, there was a while where, because the link was very new, it was quite hard for us to make contact with our colleagues in Kenya um, because of what was going on both here and there. Um, I'm really, really proud of what the team has achieved, though. And um, I have to say that I think um, Bernard in particular has worked extremely hard and has some incredible 
knowledge and skills, both local and from his public health background. Um, and we're now at a point where we've been successful in being awarded quite a substantial grant to carry out our project now that is very far from what we were thought we were going to be doing um, when we first started. So rather than me waffle on, I think I'll hand over to Bernard, who has a presentation. Are you there, Bernard? Looks like he's there. Frozen in time. Um, we can't hear you, Bernard, at the moment. Is somebody able to put up the presentation that he sent? And maybe... I don't really want to speak to it, but <laughs> I could. Uh, Bernard, just to check, are you muted? Well, it was all going so well. And it's going to go OK for the future. Um, but you may <laughs> need to slightly expand your role to be a yes. uh, key speaker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do we have the presentation? That the we presentation can... that I think Bernard Sorry. sent. So maybe we could... Uh... I, feel, I feel bad if he's. Um, this is all his work. Well, I'm sure our team in the background will be will be trying to get. So, uh, I, I, I'm also conscious that it's getting quite late, so I will. I, I can try and speak to some of it. Okay. Now, am I able to advance these slides, or has someone got to do that for me? I think someone has to do it for you. So okay. the traditional of next slide, please. I think. Yeah. Okay. So can we have the first, well, the next slide, please? Okay, or is it going to be concealed? All right, okay. So, so um, here's the team um, that went out, like I said, three years ago for what Bernard's described there as an initial engagement. So um, uh, one of my surgical colleagues, uh, Jane Rose, who's here today, and some other um, nursing and medical colleagues went out um, just for an initial engagement. Can I have the next slide? Because I think it explains what the result of that was. Oh, here's so so the, these are. Um, I think one of the key things on that initial visit was meeting the right people. So, um, you know, if if you don't know the right people in charge of the multi layers of healthcare um, in Kenya, um, you're not going to get anything done. So I think there was a lot of handshaking um, and making contact with with various levels of of the people that we needed to. Um, and there was also a lot of time spent um, looking at the, the health facilities. And at this stage, a new hospital was being built uh, or, and expanded. And so what what was the original plan was really to, to sort of help with that. And the reason I got involved was actually because part of that new hospital was a new emergency department. And emergency medicine is not really uh, particularly a, a... It's a very new concept in Kenya. Um the last time I asked, the emergency department was still not really being used for that and was being used for COVID vaccination. So obviously things have, have had to adapt. Can I have the next slide? Well, I'd rather have Bernard, but just, just keep going. There you go. So that's what I'm looking for. So um, as a result of that first visit, the team who, uh, who went, um, wrote a, quite, a fairly comprehensive initial report on what was felt with the team and our partners were the sort of a preliminary sort of needs assessment. Um, there was quite a lot of teaching that went on from the clinicians um, and a memorandum of understanding was um, written and signed between the two teams um, to sort of help to take things forward. Uh, can I have the next slide please? So here's some sort of key features of the memorandum of understanding were about um, 
shared learning. Obviously, uh, the underpinning was really about improving healthcare quality. Um, and it, quite a lot of that was about um, trying to improve data collection so that we had an understanding of what the healthcare needs were um, and trying to help reduce some of the barriers um, to particularly to accessing healthcare this is in a very remote part of Kenya. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I said, there was some preliminary data collected in that first visit um, by a multidisciplinary team who went out. Um, uh, the plan was, when we went on our visit in May of last year, to start a more comprehensive health needs assessment with our partners. Um, that got scuppered um, by the pandemic and as I said in my introduction, everything was put on hold for a few months. Um, when we sort of reconvened as a group, um, we realised that both our approach, which was going to be at least initially to be actually going out ourselves and, and, and supporting and helping, um, and what that health needs assessment was likely to be, had completely changed because of COVID-19. So we had to almost, as, a, as I said, we were very embryonic. We were already in a situation where we were just trying to feel our way and get, get an idea of what, what, what we could achieve. And we instantly had to start again almost. Um, so how are we going to do this health needs assessment um, when we couldn't go and physically be there ourselves? Um, and what was the impact of COVID? on what that what their needs were. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, here's a bit of Bernardness that I feel I do not have the skills to talk to. I'm really sorry he's not here. Um, Shall we just check? But can you speak, Bernard, and see if we can hear you? Oh, Fiona, sadly not. So I'm not. I'm not going to. I. This is a one of many frameworks that um, I say it's Bernard's thing, uh, but you can see the principles, which are what I've already alluded to: improving both health and inequalities in health, um, and trying to integrate that into what you're planning. So it becomes a you know a little flow diagram. I don't know what that is. It's, it's, they do sort of flow steps maybe aren't they um and of course one of the key things with all with all health needs assessment is who do you need to involve and how do you get their involvement and that's something that we've had to work quite hard on and has been a little bit more difficult because we haven't been on the ground to sort of meet some of the particularly the people that are sort of working on the ground rather than all the handshaking people that, that were met in that first meeting let's skip over and quick Hide that and get the next slide. Bernard better turn up and then we can go back to it. So after a few meetings, talking to our partners in Kenya, um, and as I said, it, it's a real shame Bernard's not here because he's got so much um, sort of skill and knowledge about this. Um, we made a decision that our data collection was obviously going to be going to need to be on the ground. Um, so remote from us, um, that we were going to have to look at some secondary data um, and then that there was going to have to be, in, after consultation, there was going to have to be um, some way of collecting digitally data so that it could be fed in um, to, uh, you know, for us to use to actually um, develop projects. Um, which was a little bit different from our original approach, which was going to be to go there and work with our partners and collect. We, we had got the structured interviews and the, the way we were going to collect the data was all sorted, but obviously we weren't able to do it. Can I have the next slide, please? No idea what time it is. So uh, you probably nobody will be surprised that... Um, to do the health needs assessment, we needed to understand the health services, 
we need to know what 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 our outcome measures were um what were the resources for staff that would be needed on the ground uh and what information systems were both available or necessary along with facilities for us to be able to to facilitate the assessment um and we did have some initial ideas um that we were going to uh try and fund some health workers on the ground and get them to do some of the data collection um didn't that didn't really quite get off the ground um and then we sort of the more we thought about it and the more we spoke to the guys the more we realized that actually we probably just needed to be a bit more focused and so um we chose to focus on some of the issues around actually around covid um can i have the next slide please Oh, here's Jane Rose climbing a mountain with a Kenya flag and a Welsh flag. Uh, I think this is there. If you just click forward, I think there might be a. There we go. So um, this is just a, goes a little bit back a bit. So one of the initial um, projects that we undertook. So this was on the basis of actually that first visit. Um, there were no sheets on the beds in the hospital. So. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you are aware that the, the currency in Kenya is a shilling. So um, the, the Shillings for Sheets campaign was launched and we raised a considerable amount of money. Um, and that was actually just mostly just before the COVID pandemic. Um, and we're pretty sure there are sheets on the beds now in the hospital, uh, although we haven't been able to go and, and see them ourselves. So that was that was a really successful fundraising campaign. It raised a lot of money um, and it, it kind of kept us going and motivated us when we when things were seeming pretty difficult um it was hard to engage with people um you know in in that beginning that first six months of the pandemic when i, I think some one of the other speakers has said we, we were also obviously incredibly worried about what the impact that was going to be in kenya and in africa generally so um that that success has kept us going i think can i have the next slide please So, um, I'm really sorry that writing is incredibly small, but I'm also conscious that we're running out of time. So this is just kind of where we where we've got to now, um, which is we're very pleased to say that we and again, Bernard's done a whole load of work. Um, we've been successful in getting a grant from Welsh government in order to um, do this work around COVID nineteen um, in the community. Um, and we are we've started this project so um, we're at the point of training the community health workers um, in, in equipping them and getting them out into the community to do a health a further assessment of what's going on with covid and education um, um, a whole whole heap of things uh, that literally is just about to get off the ground um, can I have the next slide, please? If there is another slide, I'm hoping I'm near the end. So this is where we're at, really. We've started this project. Um, we are we're hoping it's going to be a six month, which should it will be a six month time scale. Um, and it's going to inform and update our health needs assessment. Um, and then obviously we hopefully we'll have resources that we can share um, and that will inform further projects um, around not necessarily just COVID-19, but around um, what's going on in, the, in, in particularly in the communities around the hospital. Are there any more slides? No. I'm very sorry that that was uh, a bit on the hoof because Bernard would have spoken in more detail and eloquently um, and deserves, like I said, it's a shame he's, he's probably just, his link's probably broken or something. 
Fiona, um, Fiona you, you, were, you were very eloquent. And oh. I think you have more skills and knowledge than you, <laughs> you realise in, in, in going through those slides. I think we all felt for you. Um, being given a set of slides that aren't necessarily your own is, is, is not easy. Um, so I, I think I, I'm just so grateful that he shared them with us a few days ago and I had looked through them. <laughs> so I had a, I had a vague idea. Um, so, uh, I think um, Mike and Jane Rose look like they might be in the room. So they may yeah, have... Michael's, Michael's in the room. Um, they have something that he wants to add or correct. Hi, Michael. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, that's that's good. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Fiona. No, I don't have anything to, uh, anything to add. If uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm no expert by any means, but yeah, Bernard has, has been he, he's the expert in uh, you know in sort of uh, public health, isn't he? Um, Fiona's our, our clinical lead for this group, um, and yeah, like everyone else, we've had to adapt. You know, one of the things that's been you know quite positive. There have been positive outcomes. We did have a grant of what was it about three thousand pounds that you know Fiona referred to, which was going to be spent largely on flights for sending a team out. But now that money has been saved, you see, for something hopefully more effective. And Bernard's work on this sort of remote health needs assessment is, we hope, will prove to be you know a much more efficient use of funds. So you know, there's always uh, there's always positives, aren't there, in spite of in spite of circumstances. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question in terms of health needs assessment, because it's it's very easy, I suspect. Well, I, I know I'm guilty of this myself in the past of going out and and saying, oh, God, I can see what needs happening here. Um, and and how, how easy or difficult it was it for you to try and not look yourself too much what the needs were, but to find out from the um, your partners what they felt the needs were and what was important to them, rather than might be what was important to you? Sorry, Mike, I didn't hear, I couldn't hear you for some reason. Sorry, yeah, I, I can't I, hear I, you. I don't. Yeah, I've also not been able to hear some of the... Yeah, uh, I don't presenters. know whether it's something to do with my computer or... Yeah, okay. um, do, you want, do you want to answer this one, Fiona? Mike's talking, I can't hear him. Okay, you, did you hear my question, Fiona? I heard, I can hear you perfectly, Paul. I don't know why I can't hear Michael. Okay. okay. Let, me, let me give you an answer to that, because I I, um, I think this is a, a absolutely key fundamental thing about all the work that we... and everything you're that you're talking about on on these days and all sort of health links is is if you impose your own thoughts um on what you think individuals or a population want or need you you could be so far off the mark and it's not a partnership i don't think if you if you just say well we're the we're the western people with the money we're going to tell you what you need and what's been really interesting is that I think because we haven't, because it has all been done remotely, um, and I mean I've never actually been to visit that part of Kenya at all. Um, it, it's it's helped us realise that we have to listen to what our partners are saying because we're not on the ground looking and saying, oh look, it looks like they need X Y Z or. Um, but I think this is a, a key thing to constantly be uh, um, talking to your partners and listening and to, and to that word partnership to mean partnership, not a one sided here. We think you need this. We're, we're going to help you do it because we've always said that we don't know what, what where this Betsy link will be going. I, you know, there's links that have been going for 30, 40, 50 years. Maybe ours will be a, a long one. Maybe it'll be a short one. But. We, we if and when we have to or decide it's time to walk away or stop well, they shouldn't be reliant on us for anything should they anything that's that's evolved and that's been learned um, should be able to carry on and I don't think that can happen if you in inflict your own um, um, ideas and, and to a certain extent even values and things like that you have to recognize that well, not just healthcare, but culturally, we're very different. Okay, thank you. We have a question um, from Angela. It's a follow-up, really, to that question because two things. One is we always ask the midwives 
what topics they want to cover and invariably the same topics come up and we liaise with the Ministry of Health but also it, I think we really need to remember that when we go to our countries we learn as much from them as they do from us and so we we call our workshops skills sharing so the midwives come and our midwives have learned so much techniques and all sorts of things that they hadn't heard of before and they bring them back so it's about sharing it isn't about us as you said fiona going in and saying this is what we think you need because that just puts people back if somebody did that to me i would be livid i tell them what we think we need and invariably it's it's exactly what they need um we could do a whole host of things but it's really it's prioritizing one of the most important and what will save the most lives thank you angela uh, gordon's got a question How much of the health need you identified um, can be addressed by primary care and how much by secondary care? Mike, do you do want to answer that? Can Why don't yeah, I think we're still, yeah, we're still at a, an, an intermediate stage of the I health need. I can't hear you though, <laughs> I'm sorry, I am talking. Um, uh, but uh, Bernard would be able to answer this if he were able to talk. But. Um, we're still in the process of putting together that health needs assessment. And like, you know, like Fiona's saying just now, it's it's not for us to prioritise. There were in the sort of initial, um, if you like, the, the initial version of the health needs assessment that we had so far, there were both primary and secondary care aspects, uh, you know, identifiable. But we had not got to the stage where we were starting to prioritise those or agree on priorities with them. Um, uh, Busia County, the the uh, uh, the locally devolved sort of healthcare there. Um, so it, I suppose the short answer to the, the question is it, it it includes both at the moment. Thank you. We have a question from Emma. Um, this worryingly is for Bernard, so um, be prepared. <laughs> I'm guessing this might be a question of Bernard. But how did you digitize the HNA tools? app or Google Google Forms or whatever? I think that's a question for Bernard. Do you know what, do you know which? Bernard, well, I'm just going to suggest, Bernard, could you, uh, uh, difficult for you to write a, 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 something in the chat because you're not mm -hmm. allowed to put too much in, but are you able to help Emma with that, Bernard? Yeah, I know. Uh, Bernard Mike might know. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't know in detail, but I know this is one of the things we've um, the the Bernard at the moment uh, is actually undertaking training with our partners um, in, in Kenya. And so we're at this stage of um, deciding what's the most appropriate form of data collection and, and digitization and so on. And I know that in the initial version, we we'd agreed to part of our funding would go towards purchasing mobile devices. And again, because of various things that that um, we, we had a change a few weeks ago on that. And again, I'm not, not quite sure what the up to date version of, of that is. Um, I'm afraid, again, the detail of this answer would have to come from Bernard and if he's able to write it in the chat. But that's something if you were to ask us, I think if you were to ask us this question again in about a month's time, um, we would be able to tell you what sort of things are starting to work and starting to be effective. So at the moment, I, I think if I can answer on Bernard's behalf, um we're just trying to find out what would be i mean bernard has some brilliant ideas already on this um and we've got sort of contingency for various different plans okay thank you for that and and and, and bernard is making some suggestion in in the chat so emma's going to uh, pick up on that uh, it's it's six o'clock now i'm aware people will we will be wanting to get away so um a big thank you fiona you know thank you so much for managing so brilliantly in in difficult circumstances but hey isn't 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 that about the sort of work we do is that something that crops up all the time um but i think you've done that 
magnificently. So big thanks to you and thanks, Mike, for uh, of giving some support as well. Um, I, I mean, wow. I mean, four great presentations, four great, um, great projects that have been going on that certainly all seem to be making a difference. And very much the theme of uh, perhaps um, people in Wales being more comfortable now about letting go of some of the responsibilities, some of the direction, and in increasingly um, allowing our partners to take over some of the some of the direction. And, and 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 doesn't that fit in really with the discussions that we've been having over the last two days? So many thanks to you and um, the four projects that we've heard from today. Thank you for sharing what you've done and your enthusiasm. And hopefully it's as a subsequent conference we can we can hear how those projects have progressed um into the future so um we'll we'll wi wind up now um so um thank you to the people in the back who i know have been tearing their hair out a little bit in this session you know but it it it's come across as as reasonably smooth running from this this side of things so a big thank you for 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 helping out in the background um can i um just remind you that the Tony Jewell lecture is coming up on December the 2nd. There has been a link in the chat earlier on today. Um, it would be great to see uh, some of you there. going to be talking about um, childhood adverse experiences and the importance of, of, of looking after children and their health and their care in the future and how we do that by Anthony Costello. And there's going to be a response from the... Um, well-being future generation commissioner sophie howe uh, as well so i think that's going to be quite a good event um so that's going to be uh, i mean a very good event not quite a good event a very good event uh, on november the second in the evening um do check out the wales uh, and africa health links network website to find out a little bit more about what we do if you're interested please um uh, come onto our mailing list so we can keep in touch with you get involved come to you um more of our conferences and, and meetings and possibly um, get involved in helping us um, try and improve uh, the work that we do as, as individual health links. Um, I just need to check um, with our Hub Cymru support that we have covered everything. Hub Cymru support? <laughs> Hub Cymru support is nearly done for the whole of the conference. So that's a positive. Um, normally we would run polls at this stage, but um, I'm just going to ask one question, if that's OK, um, just to limit the amount of time we're going to spend online. And it's just whether you intend to take any action as a result of this session. So we're interested to hear that. So I'm showing that poll, I hope. Um, and um, did you have an aha moment or a moment of um, sorry? I'm just bringing the next one up, which is whether you've improved your knowledge as a result of this session, which I think are probably the main objectives in um in these two sessions. So I'm going to leave them up only temporarily because it is late in the day and we um, have overrun ever so slightly. Um, and then I will potentially disappear from screen again um, and let Catherine and Paul finish the session and yeah just apologies for some of the problems in the background this platform's been marvelous for doing straightforward speeches and talks but as soon as you have multiple people coming in from all over the world it suddenly becomes a little bit more unmanageable um so i'm just gonna give this poll one more minute and then i'm gonna um close the polls so thank you very much, Claire, and 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 thank you for um, helping us out this evening and and doing. I know a lot of. Um, I almost said jiggery pokery, but it, maybe it is jiggery pokery. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, to keep the show on the growing, and and many thanks to everybody who stayed with us. Thanks for your participation. Thanks for your interest. Thanks for your questions. Um, Catherine, do you want to just say a few words at the end? Yep, I won't keep uh, anybody any longer. It's just been a fantastic session, and it just goes to show how um, you learn from getting involved in a partnership. You just deal with with challenges, don't you? You just rise to the occasion. We're all used to these issues in in our partnerships, where and everybody's demonstrated that. Uh, wonderfully and Paul thank you so much for chairing this this has been the most difficult session in the conference and, and I'm uh, sorry that you got dumped with it but you've risen to the challenge amazingly and uh, the Help Cymru Africa team as ever have been fantastic so next year 
let's hope that we're going to have a face-to-face -face event and have real networking and get to see each other. And maybe at this time of the day, we'll maybe uh, share a cup of tea and a celebration um, at the end of <laughs> at the end of another wonderful conference. It'll all be online. People can watch it again or watch anything that you've missed. Um, and keep in touch. Get on our mailing list. Uh, and thanks again, everybody, for joining in and putting so much into making this a great event. So see you next year. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye.